Welcome to the next installment of Insider Insights. If you want to learn more about entrepreneurship, working with Elon Musk at SpaceX, health optimization, fitness and longevity, you're going to love this episode. What's going on guys? I'm Kevin Jubal, former plastic surgery resident. And in this episode, we're talking with Level's founder, Josh Clemente. I heard about their product on the Kevin Rose Show podcast. I went out, signed up, and I liked it so much that I reached out to the Level's team to learn more about it and then share those insights with you. Today, we're speaking with Josh Clemente, founder at Level's, who's a mechanical engineer by trade and CrossFit Level 2 trainer. He worked at SpaceX, leading a team to develop life support systems for astronauts, and also spent time developing the Hyperloop technology. We cover his story about what led him to founding Levels, the lessons he's learned in entrepreneurship, the future of wearables, how to optimize athletic performance and recovery, and much more. This was a super awesome conversation that you're sure to find value in. Please enjoy my conversation with Josh Clemente. All right, so Josh, thanks so much for joining me. Um, a few days ago, we actually had Dr. Casey Means, Level's CMO, uh, on, on the Insider's Insights uh, show, and it was an awesome conversation. We talked about COVID and metabolic health and why we should care about metabolic health, even if we're young and seemingly healthy, and the closed loop of behavior change and a few other, a few other interesting things. It was, it was a great chat. Um, and in this call, I want to focus on a few other things about Level's. So... Real briefly, my actual introduction to Levels was hearing your podcast with Kevin Rose a few months ago, and that you know piqued my interest. And at that time, I was doing, I was experimenting with a ketogenic diet. I had a a keto mojo, and I was actually taking you know blood sugar and blood ketone measurements intermittently. But obviously, that's not as uh, granular as a continuous glucose monitor or CGM. And, uh, and now we're here. So I ended up, I ended up signing up. I did a month. I was so impressed. I reached out to you guys. And anyways, really, really excited to have you here. Well, thanks for having me on, Kevin. And, and thank you also for um, putting me after Casey. I'm sure your, your listeners are going to get a ton of value from hers and I'll try and do the same on, <laughs> on this one. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's really exciting to be able to talk about these things and uh, be proliferating this tech. I think it's got massive, massive potential. Absolutely. So Josh, you are, you essentially started Levels. You're the founder. Um, well, you have a co-founding team, but you were really the one who who started this this whole journey. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Definitely. Yeah, I, I consider myself to be kind of patient zero for the use case here, and uh, that was due to just stumbling upon uh, CGM because of a, a series of experiments that I was running to try and find a way to feel better every day. Um, I a, a few years back I was leading. Uh, pressurized life support systems team at SpaceX. And I was kind of hitting this burning out point, you know, cognitively, mentally and physically, I was feeling uh, kind of at the worst that I could recall. And uh, I would have these waves of fatigue, shakiness, irritability. Uh, my memory was really cloudy. And I just genuinely was struggling to make it through a workday effectively and kind of ramping up my caffeine intake uh, disproportionately to my output. And um, at the same time, I, I came across some research from Dom Diagostino from University of South Florida. And it was just an interesting paper that talked about how the ketogenic diet was extending lifespan or uh, time until a, a seizure for rodents that were exposed to a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. And that study like totally stopped me in my tracks because it was this crazy superpower that these rodents were getting essentially from a different macronutrient, uh, macronutrient blend. And I had uh, up until that point kind of been just a calorie is a calorie type person. I, I would eat whatever I wanted. And as long as I was working out effectively and, um, you know, hitting the gym hard, I assumed that I was healthy. And so these two things kind of happened around the same time. And I just recognized the fact that this, uh, you know, nutrition component is totally missing from my life. I have no feedback to tell me whether or not what I'm doing is, is effective. Um, it's clear that there is physiologic benefit or physiologic potential to, to make changes in the body. Uh, based on different macronutrient intakes. And so I just wanted some objective data. I wanted to feel better. And um, up until that point, you know, I had actually gone to my doctor and, and said, I, I think I have a terminal illness. Like something is so wrong that I, I need to figure out what it is. You, you know, please help me, you know, run blood, blood tests or whatever to find out what's off. And those had come back totally without findings. So uh, anyway, I started pricking my finger to measure blood sugar. And this was like just kind of an attempt to find something interesting. I assumed that energy was going to be related to the primary energy molecule. So glucose as good as any, um, started pricking my finger, couldn't make anything of it. 
eventually I read a book about CGM. Well, I read a book called Wired to Eat and in it, Rob Wolf talks about CGM. And that was my first exposure to this technology, which is the continuous glucose monitor. It was developed for the management of diabetes. And I just thought, huh, you know, I'm pricking my finger a bunch of times a day. I'm not I'm not getting like large chunks of, of the data because I'm sleeping or I'm working out and this would be awesome. So I asked my doctor for the device. Um, he said, no, you don't need to monitor glucose un unless you're diabetic. A few other physicians that I tried through telehealth also gave me the same response. And so it took me a long time, but I eventually got a CGM. And when I did, I was totally blown away by how bad things were. Um, within about a week or two of data, I had enough to know that I was either borderline or full-blown pre-diabetic. You know, I was way, way outside the normal range. Every meal I was eating was putting me above 140, 160, sometimes into the 180s. And I would stay there for, for some time and then come crashing down. And those, those reactive uh, sort of insulin crash episodes were where I was feeling those symptomatic fatigue moments. And, you know, it perfectly correlated with wanting to just curl up under my desk and sleep and the irritability and brain fog and headaches that I was experiencing. So I use that same data to just completely renovate my approach to, to diet, exercise, sleep, and stress. And, you know, that experience of just understanding there's an accessibility issue, there's this amazing technology. It's not being used to its potential in uh, the sort of general wellness or preventative um, uh, capacity. And there's also an actionability issue where I had to do a huge amount of research to understand what I should what my data should look like. And, uh, and so it's, it's not easy for someone to just pick this up and uh, make changes, right? And so it became an obvious opportunity to, to help a lot of people the way that this tech had helped me. So that brings up a, a question I have, which is why do, you think, why do you think physicians are more reluctant to prescribe a CGM to someone who isn't diabetic? Well, I think there's a, a couple of things that make this an interesting uh, time in terms of regulations. Uh, I think, I think it comes down to the indicated use. So right now all CGMs that have been developed are indicated for the use, uh, in managing diabetes. And so I think physicians are, they want to make sure that they're doing the doing, doing best by their patient. And so using something off label, uh, I think immediately causes some, some concern where it, you know, I think physicians want to justify it with a diagnosis of some kind, you know, some, some medical rationale in order to proceed with a prescription for something like that. And, uh, you know, I, I think the, the separation is just that this technology has acute concerns for someone who is metering insulin into their bodies. You know, if you are someone with type one diabetes and you need to bolus insulin effectively, you have to know where your glucose is momentarily, and you have to be able to, to trust the data in order to make sure that you don't end up in a deadly situation where you over inject or something like that. And, and so that's kind of historically why the devices are prescription only and class three medical devices. So that's not the, the context within which physicians have to like assume, okay, determine whether or not to, um, you know, write a prescription for someone else. They're, they're writing it with class three protocols in place. So I, I think it's a matter of pushing the technology forward to the point where over-the-counter solutions exist and the indications are expanded to general wellness. And um, there are a few technology developments needed to make that easy, but I, I think at that point, physicians will have no problem uh, proliferating these. Yeah, Levels is really essentially bringing CGM to the masses. It's like democratizing it in a way. I didn't train in primary care, so I'm not sure if this is right or if this applies here, but one other idea I have is that in medicine, generally, you don't want to be doing tests. You know, like you don't want to do a broad array of tests, especially if you don't, like, like don't. What's the saying? It's, it's don't go looking for something that you don't necessarily want to find out. And you know, you see this a lot, like in inpatient care. But even in this instance, if someone, if they give someone a CGM and then that patient has maybe larger spikes than they should they may not be well equipped to then handle that or know the next steps because as everyone knows, nutrition and, and medical training is not what it should be. Um, when you were talking about burning out, I'm curious, how much do you think of that was due to your diet versus other things in your life like stress, sleep? Because when I was wearing levels, I was shocked to see how massive of a difference just sleep deprivation made in my glucose response. Yeah, I, I think I was 
burning the candle at all ends. Um, there are four big levers that we're playing with every day when we live. And, and I think those are nutrition, sleep, stress management outside of sleep, and then exercise, um, or physical exertion. And, um, what I was doing is working absurd hours, sleeping poorly, uh, filling my body with stress inducing caffeine, uh, and eating whatever I could get my hands on and then exercising really hard to try and make up for it. And what was happening was I was creating this perfect storm where everything was working against me. Um, my sleep quality was very poor. My recovery was very poor, which was putting me into uh, an even further stressed state. Um, you know, there, is, there are studies that show that just a single short night of sleep can in increase uh, insulin resistance by 40%. So it, essentially the insulin load has to increase by 40% in order to handle the same glucose load. And uh, so when you have that sort of vicious feedback loop where you're sleeping poorly, not recovering, more stressed, uh, oftentimes this, this goes on for, for weeks at a time. And then going and hitting the gym really hard as well, which again is inducing cortisol and adrenaline and like all the, all the stress associated with it. Um, and then on top of that, adding the insult of uh, selecting for foods that just are, I, I was extremely sensitive to and causing massive blood sugar imbalances. Um, I, I think I had created in myself kind of a mechanical prediabetes where um, I, I just had the degree of cortisol and insulin in my body that made it nearly impossible to metabolize food effectively. So, um, I, I think it was, it was all of the above. And now every decision I make is, is much more nuanced and context dependent. So when I have a poor night of sleep, rather than indulging in food that will make me feel better, I will uh, do the opposite and try to eat even better than I otherwise would, because I know that I'm compromised on that. And because I'm seeing the data, you know, my fasting glucose will go up my responses to any meals, my response, even to caffeine will be higher. Um, so seeing that helps keep me, uh, compensating for that, you know, sort of sleep issue on the other three levers. So I'll, I'll exercise a little bit more, uh, you know, maybe on the type or uh, the, the zone two, like cardio direction, rather than high intensity CrossFit stuff, I will try and make up for that sleep as soon as possible, maybe practice some breathing and mindfulness and, and certainly eat better. Um, and so all of that, like, I think that's really the big thing is that it was not just one issue that was, that was going on, going wrong in my, in my life at that time, it was the perfect storm of just extreme stress and, and pushing myself to the limit. Now, starting a company of any type is a very challenging endeavor. And I think doing it in a very regulated space like health is even more challenging. So I'm wondering what were some of those initial obstacles you guys faced? You obviously have recruited a, a team of very impressive talent to, to help you, um, you know, take the levels to where it is today. And I'm curious if you can speak to how you built such a good team, lessons you've learned, obstacles you had to overcome in getting levels to where it is today. Yeah. Um, so the first six months of the company and, and really about a year of research prior to starting the company were spent just trying to understand the regulatory environment, the legal environment, um, and, and how to build a business model that would allow proliferation of the technology, democratization, as you put it, um, without sort of overstepping. You know, we wanted to make sure that we were building a business that could handle health information uh, securely and, and correctly and could allow engagements between uh, telehealth physicians and potential customers uh, in order to achieve prescriptions that were necessary for the devices and all, all these sorts of um, necessary structure pieces, which took, took quite a bit of time and, and a lot of uh, attention to detail. And so it was, it was really important to have a, an amazing team to uh, sort of force multiply on this. And I think ultimately what we have working in our favor here is a, an opportunity to help a huge number of people. And I'll just touch on my perspective on Casey, for example. You know, she's a former surgeon. She was an ear, nose, and throat surgeon who turned into a functional medicine doctor because she was seeing so much inflammation in her patients and wanted to go solve the upstream problem of inflammation. And I think it then became clear that she wanted to make an even bigger impact because she could help her patients as an individual contributor, but how do you scale that? And so when we, when we met and talked about the potential for something like levels, which is focused on the, in many cases, underlying cause of chronic inflammation for people, which is metabolic dysfunction uh, and insulin resistance, it, I, I think really appealed to her right away for that reason. And then you look at, you know, my other co-founders, Andrew Connor, who read, who led uh, engineering for Google Voice, 
uh, David Flinner, who, who ran uh, product and payments at Google, and uh, Sam Corcos, multi-time founder, software engineer. You know, all of them saw the opportunity to scale benefit for for humans. You know, people could immediately change their approach to to lifestyle and meaningfully and potentially uh, dramatically reverse uh, some of the the issues that they you know could be experiencing, both qualitatively and in their quantitative risk of illness. And, uh, you know, do this across a number of enough people and you could potentially have social scale change in our, um, our metabolic epidemic. And so I think just having that large of a problem, that huge challenge attracts people who are competitive and, uh, looking for a big mission to sign on to. So I, I think that partially has to do with, with how, you know, we initially got such uh, great talent in, interested. And then the rest of it is on execution, you know, just maintaining a culture of execution oriented people and, uh, making sure that we're constantly moving the ball forward and that when you are moving the ball forward, everyone knows about it and can share in, in that, you know, satisfaction and, um, just enjoy the process as it's going. So being a very open culture and being very, you know, like I said, execution oriented, I think really helps to continue to capitalize on those people who are, uh, you know, they're by nature going to be working on a big problem and they want to do so quickly and effectively. And, and so you got to keep tapping into that now. With your time at SpaceX and, and working with Elon Musk, Elon Musk is, you know, the first time I heard about first principles thinking was probably reading, you know, one of the biographies about him. Um, you know, what, what kind of lessons or insights or processes did you take from your time at SpaceX and incorporate that into your time here at, at Levels? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. You know, I think Elon is one of the most interesting people, certainly that I've ever met, but um, <laughs> potentially out there. The first principles thinking is really transformative. It, it seems so simple, but it's really quite tricky. You know, we by nature, I think, complicate things. Humans tend to focus on the peripheral, um, you know, sort of tangential problems first, you know, all the things that could go wrong, all the things that um, have already been someone else has already done this and they've decided it's, it's not possible, you know, and, and what first principles thinking does is it goes to the root of any question and asks, what is the, ba the most basic, most fundamental problem, or uh, should I say uh, challenge that would have to be overcome in order for this to ha happen. And, you know, an example of this would be like when Elon first priced out what a rocket should cost, he took the amount of aluminum in a rocket body and multiplied it by the cost of wholesale aluminum. And he was like, all right, so it should cost roughly that plus some, some labor. And uh, that's the type of thing where it's like a very, very basic answer to the, to the, the most basic uh, subset of the problem. And that's tricky to do, you know, to, to really go and, and dig down into the core. And I think that's what we're trying to do at levels is take some first principles approaches where, you know, you want people to make better decisions every day in order to be healthier, but they don't have any data telling them whether or not a decision was good or bad. And so you instead have heuristics and platitudes and things like, you know, eat healthier and work out more. But on, unless you can tell someone that what you just ate was healthier for you, um, it's very hard for people to internalize that and turn it into action. So we're definitely implementing first principles approaches here, um, trying not to focus too much on the way things have historically been done and instead think, you know, what is the, uh, the right way to attack this problem to make it ele elegant and simple and uh, ultimately like achieve some, some change. And then I also want to say that like, you know, working on engineering systems contributed to this significantly as well. So, uh, you know, I, I am a systems engineer and uh, we have essentially the, in, in control theory, you have uh, two ways to control a system and that that's open loops and closed loops. And with open loops, essentially the system doesn't take into account the output of a prior decision, right? So this would be, you hit the, the accelerator in your car and the car accelerates, but you have no idea how fast you're going. And so that doesn't contribute to whether or not you hit the accelerator again. Now, the way we obviously work with like a, a cruise control system in a car is a closed loop where the, you know, you set the, the cruise control and then the system is constantly measuring both how fast you're going. And when it applies the accelerator, it measures how much faster you, you are now going before it determines whether to continue pressing the accelerator. And so that's called a, con a closed loop control system. And, you know, all humans are currently operating on an open loop system where they make a decision and they do not get any feedback on it in some cases for months, years, decades. Uh, and this is like, waiting until the bathroom scale has risen by 30 pounds 
or until you get a diagnosis of diabetes to, to start thinking about how to change your lifestyle. So we're, we're bringing that, that sort of engineering driven closed loop theory into uh, the world of wellness where you, you make a choice, you sit down to eat something for lunch. What are you going to eat and why? Well, right now you don't know, but you're going to try something. And now you can see your body's response to that minutes later. And that will affect, you know, by default, that's now in your psychology. And you will take that into account both uh, with and without the data in the future. You've now learned something about yourself. And so that closed loop behavior change model is, is really powerful. We're learning where people, you know, they don't want to make unhealthy decisions. And so by equipping them with, you know, with those closed loops, you can really affect some really powerful changes in a short period of time. The other thing I, I think is interesting about the way Elon approaches building new markets is starting by establishing premium positioning to define a new category. And then that, that can change public perception altogether about something. And, and the way he did this, like, like with Tesla, for example, with electric vehicles is um, he, you know, electric vehicles were, were for nerds. They weren't interesting. They weren't cool. Um, and he suddenly came out with the Tesla Roadster, which was an expensive and gorgeous car and everyone wanted one. And it completely transformed assumptions about electric vehicles. And so first there was the Tesla Roadster and then uh, Elon published the secret master plan, which talks about, you know, the end goal is not roadsters for rich people. You know, it's, it's to put the model three or the an even more affordable car out there, which everyone can access and can really change the environment and, and reduce pollution and, and make cars clean. And so he, he did this in a very deliberate approach where it started with a premium product and then slowly but surely was able to finance larger and larger scale and move down market. And, you know, right now, I think we're, we're taking something similar with our approach and we actually blatantly ripped off the, <laughs> the secret master plan and wrote one of our own to describe how, you know, right now we're taking an expensive medical technology and building a premium product with it. And that's intentional in two directions. Like first, it's important for us to be a, a fun, fundamentally secure business, like to be able to pay our bills. And, and uh, that requires, you know, being able to pay for the product. So we have to be expensive right now. But second, it allows us to establish this in a premium market and, and really build a product that is almost luxury and that um, will, will kind of have a Peloton-like feel to it. And then with time, you know, we feel that the adoption rates will increase and we'll be able to achieve uh, better unit economics and the supply and demand mechanism will work and we'll be able to move down market in a very similar fashion to make this accessible for everyone because you know, the end goal of levels is to reverse the trends of metabolic dysfunction. And so this has to be accessible to, to the entire population. It can't just be kind of in this, in this expensive category for long. I noticed the, the power of this closed loop system when I was wearing levels because for, for two things, first of all, things that I thought were healthier than they really are. I was like, oh, I should actually, you know, it's not, it's not good for me. But then it, it, it didn't necessarily make me not want to ever have those things. Like I, I enjoy smoothies, for example. But it was then a matter of playing around with other variables, such as how closely do I have it, you know, before or after exercise, or if I'm sleep deprived, things like that, that would then allow me to have that immediate feedback and then adjust my behavior. So it's much more powerful that way. Then, then kind of guessing like, oh yeah, smoothies, they, they're not juice, they have some fiber, it's, it's fine. Then, you know, spiking up to 180, I'm like, okay, that's, that's not good. Um, now, I, I have an Apple Watch, I use an Aura ring when I, when I sleep and, you know, level CGM. There's all these different bio-wearables that are giving a lot of useful data every day. And I'm curious where you see the future of wearables going, both in the industry at large and specifically with levels. Yeah, you know, it's... I, I wear, so I've got these two, I've got a Garmin and an Apple or a Garmin and a whoop strap on. And, uh, and then I'm also wearing levels and my phone takes a bunch of data. So there's just all these sort of disparate sources of data right now. And I think what we're going to see is in increasing, first of all, the, it, we're, we're decentralizing the problem right now. There are more wearables coming to market, you know, levels being a new entrant with, with bio wearables where you can actually measure a molecule. And uh, so we'll continue to see, I think, uh, new entrants measuring new and, and uh, interesting things. And then I think we're going to see consolidation. So in, in the five to 10 year time frame, I would expect to see a, an analyte or a multi-analyte system that can bring in both bio uh, information. So multiple molecules that are interesting for uh, metabolism and general wealth or general health. And then a, uh, a sort of integration with traditional wearable metrics like HRV, heart rate, 
body temperature. And I think this is going to change form factors and probably be in a patch format uh, due to the fact that the, the like cutting edge sensor technology is still semi-invasive where it does have to, you know, have a filament in the skin to measure molecules directly. And I don't expect that we'll get to non-invasive for maybe like 10 years. Um, so I, I would, I would guess like in the five year time frame, we'll have a multi-analyte patch that you'll wear that will replace essentially everything. It'll do sleep tracking. It will do nutrition tracking. It will do uh, stress management, uh, activity, all of the interesting stuff that we have in, in all of these things all over our bodies right now will consolidate into a single unit. And we'll, we will probably wear this on a continuous basis, uh, um, for, for, you know, years at a time. And I think it's going to really change the way people engage with, um, everything from their, their sleep quality to, uh, the kind of the, I think the, the demand for products that support better health. So I think we're going to see transformation as a result of this multi-analyte sensor in our food supply, the way we do, uh, medicine, patient, physician interactions and big data, you know, analysis of this, of society and, and where the, um, the causal factors lie in, in health complications. That would be super powerful. This reminds me of, I was working at Blue Link, this biomedical health incubator. And there was one company, uh, or rather one speaker that, you know, had founded a company where he, he was developing a patch that had these micro needles. So it was just getting your interstitial fluid, but then from that extrapolating your blood glucose. And supposedly it was, it was going to be accurate enough. Um, what, like, first of all, how far away do you, do you think something like that is? And then secondly, what other, what other, like, what other things can we be measuring that you think are, are feasible? You know, what it, maybe insulin, maybe ketones, is that in the near future? Is that, do we not have a, a solution? Yeah. Um, I, I think that what's first necessary is in order to achieve that future where we are measuring the important molecules that are, you know, at the root of chronic illness and, and health on the other side of the coin is we need innovation and we need to demonstrate that there's a massive market. And there is, you know, people are desperate for better information about themselves. As I mentioned earlier, I, I don't think anyone wants to be unhealthy. Um, you know, metabolic dysfunction contributes to blindness. It's the number one cause of non-accidental amputations. It's, it's associated with infertility. It's so many of our quality of life issues are associated with this and nobody wants to experience that. So we're, right now we're in kind of a, a technology desert where, you know, CGM, for example, is maybe the first technology that we're going to be able to bridge into general wellness, but it only exists because we wanted to monitor a symptom. Um, and, and so first we need to change that paradigm and we need innovation in real-time monitoring solutions for the pure purpose of giving better data to the individual who wants to be healthier. Um, and I think we're, we're kind of, you know, we're definitely working in this direction, showing that there's a huge number of people that want this today and, and would get access to it. And then once that, I think once, once you demonstrate that you'll have innovation happening in the hardware side, um, to a, to a much larger degree. And so, um, once, once we get that flywheel going, I anticipate, yes, having real-time access to the important hormones. Um, I, I would, I would bet that cortisol and insulin will be the, first, the number one and two most interesting hormones to measure. And, um, there are definitely some others that I'm interested in, uh, leptin, ghrelin being a few interesting ones, like whether or not, you know, these control hunger and satiety, um, glucagon might be really interesting there. There's, you know, those get kind of into the weeds, but I would say if we could get insulin and cortisol, we'd be solving for the 80, 20, uh, benefit. And then I really think that you want to understand what energy substrate you're pulling from. So if we could measure, uh, free fatty acids in the blood along with glucose, that would be phenomenal. And even if you just had those four molecules, um, you'd be covering a huge number of the questions that you're trying to solve for when you design a lifestyle today and uh, having that closed loop in combination with, you know, an accelerometer measuring your activity and your body temperature and, uh, you know, step count or, or whatever you're, you're interested in plus heart rate variability. You really have kind of a, a single device that is doing a dramatic amount to educate the individual on the quality of their choices. So I, I would say that yeah, five years from now, that's totally achievable. Do you do you see levels investing in the actual device um, innovation? We're doing a lot of research in this space, and um, definitely still determining the right move. Uh, we, by default, I think we are investing in the space by investing in creating this market. We're contributing to 
additional um, uptake of technology that would otherwise not, um, I, I think, would otherwise not be expanding in its its use case. So, Absolutely. by you know the traditional manufacturers, um, you know, will benefit, of course, from from us opening up access to it, and then uh, by demonstrating that the use case is is reasonable, and then also showing efficacy in our use case. So, running research to to demonstrate that people who don't yet have diabetes can meaningfully improve both quality of life and quantitative risk of chronic illness through the the use of real-time biomarker tracking, I think we then um, double down and we can start to move down market. We can improve the price point, supply demand, you know, mechanisms will, will I think allow unit economics to improve. And all of that will open up opportunity for other entrants to come into the space and continue to, to disrupt and cause innovation to happen. So, you know, I think that's going to happen one way or another, whether we get into hardware or not. Uh, personally, being kind of a hardware buff, I, I love those, <laughs> those problems. And I, I certainly would love to be involved in the development process more directly. So um, yeah, not entirely sure what levels specifically is going to be doing just yet, but certainly more to come on that as we learn um, what the right move is. Now changing gears a little bit, there's a lot of a lot of artificial or, or, or alternative sweeteners out there on the market. And I'm curious, do you guys have any insights based on your data with levels on how they influence blood sugar? So um, by the way, for, for anyone who'd like to, I just listened to a really good AMA episode of The Drive with Peter Tia about this, where he, he dives in pretty deep. And I'm certainly not the expert on artificial sweeteners, but um, it's been interesting. We, we've looked at some of the data in the data set, and you know, honestly, there doesn't seem to be a huge effect from the, the mainstream ones, stevia, uh, monk fruit, and allulose. Uh, what else? I, oh, sucralo sucralose and aspartame. Like of, of those, I don't think we've seen anything really move glucose response significantly. Um, and I know that uh, Dr. Tia talks about allulose potentially having a glucose lowering effect. It, it tends to work like a, you know, it works like an SGLT2 drug, which will tend to cause you to excrete sugar in the urine, which I think is really interesting. I haven't seen a glucose lowering effect. I, I, I use allulose pretty consistently and monk fruit. So um, genuinely or generally what, what I'm looking for is an artificial sweetener that does not cause a blood sugar elevation and then also does not cause a blood sugar dip because that could indicate that you're having an insulin response to that artificial sweetener. And that would kind of defeat the purpose of, I, I think, using that in the first place. So um, across the board, like I, I certainly don't, am not aware of any such issues with the like mainstream sweeteners, which is surprising to me and also possibly a good thing. But um, I would say we need more, <laughs> more research before we say, go ahead and dump that in the coffee. That's an interesting point you raise, which is that if you saw a a dip in your blood sugar, that would be your body secreting insulin in response to the artificial sweetener, even though the artificial sweetener is not glucose based. So that's a that's a good point I hadn't considered. There's some really interesting stuff with you know the psychological, I think, hormonal implications of sugar. Where you know there was one study which just showed that athletes who do a mouth rinse with sugar, like they'll they'll take a sweetened beverage and do a mouth rinse and spit it out their blood sugar will, will rise. And, um, oh, wow. that's, that seems to be totally backwards in my opinion, but, um, yeah, that, that was a really fascinating one. So I think that it is possible that just tasting sweetness on the tongue can cause your body to, to release some hormones that are associated with metabolizing it. And so that's what you, we would look for in a sweetener. And it might be that you, you just get sensitized or desensitized to the sweetener. So it could very well be that different people have different responses depending on how often they consume them. You know, somebody who has 10 diet Cokes a day uh, may have a totally different insulin, insulinogenic response than someone who has the first one in six months. Right. So that, that's where I really want to look is like, does it affect everyone the same? And um, you know, is there a one size fits all answer to our artificial sweeteners? Right. You know, going back to those, those hormones. Um, so ghrelin is, is implicated with hunger, leptin with satiety, um, glucagon mobilizes the glucose from the muscles. Um, are, are those hormones that you're interested in because of, because they, they relate to nutrition and diet or are there certain things that you would be, you'd be looking out for? Like what, what kind of knowledge do we already have about these, these hormones and what things would we want to optimize for within each? It's interesting. I, I've heard of leptin resistance being potentially another 
another issue contributing to the obesity crisis, where essentially because we're overeating so consistently, you can develop a similar numbing effect to, you know, to what we describe in insulin resistance, but for leptin receptors. And so people just cease to feel the satiety effect and will continue to eat calories that they don't need, uh, on an ongoing basis. And, um, I would say right now that it's, it's not like the insulin hormone is the, the most interesting by far because insulin resistance is so closely tied to, to all of the major issues that we want to resolve. But if we could solve for insulin, it seems like we are likely close to the form factor, uh, or the technology platform that we could also get these other hormones that can really provide a really, a rich data set, right? And if you're trying to figure out what are the true underlying effects that are leading to obesity and insulin resistance in the, in the first place, I think we want as many metrics as possible in a real time format and in a longitudinal uh, sense. So if you can get, you know, if you can crowdsource this by having people wearing a device that they're getting daily value from, um, helping them stick to their goals, achieving, um, you know, exercise, sleep and, and nutritional quality that they otherwise wouldn't, if they didn't have the closed loop feedback, and you can get a ton more data on what, uh, sort of hormonal environment they're operating under, it will, you know, be a total game changer for research purposes, you know, and this can all be done in an anonymized fashion. So each individual is, is, is not identified by their data, but I think the, the potential to look at a huge population size data set on this and have that, that, um, sort of deep insight into multiple hormones and lifestyle behaviors, it would just completely, I think it would solve the problem. We would, we would no longer be questioning, you know, <laughs> what are the contributing factors? Earlier this summer, I did my first ever century on a bike. Uh, so that's a hundred miles cycling. And uh, it was very slow, it took us longer than it should have, but it was just me and my buddy. Um, and I had never done it before. I did a lot of research. I spoke with my, my trainer about optimal, you know, uh, I guess nutrition and feeding and, and not burning out during that time because the term they use is like bonking when you just you you get totally you like hit a wall and my buddy he's he's in his later 30s now but when he was in his 20s he, he would do 200 miles at once and i was like wow that's some next level stuff and he's he's like walking in all kind of, i've done 200 miles 100 miles isn't gonna be an issue and he had two meals he had a hot dog we stopped at a, at a golf course at the uh yeah at, like the the club and he had a hot dog and then he ate something else later on in the ride and he was not having a good time meanwhile i was i was um just munching on like cliff bars and various energy bars one every hour on the hour and i ended up doing mostly okay i had a little bit of a few issues around mile 60 or 70 and and he just he was not he was not having it at all so i'm curious if um I wonder what would have happened if we were both wearing CGMs, but but more broadly, I'm curious what insights a CGM or you know something like Levels can provide an an athlete either for performance, you know, during the actual event or for recovery afterwards. First off, congrats on the century. I have I've yet Thanks. to achieve that milestone. Um, yeah, this one's really exciting to me because it's uncharted territory, and I have bonked consistently in my, in my initial forays into endurance training. So I I've historically been like kind of a sprint athlete doing, uh, I played rugby, I played ice hockey. Uh, I, I'm a CrossFit trainer. I, I really like the kind of explosive, interesting to me, you know, workouts. They're, they're like the things that keep me moving constantly. And I don't get kind of caught up in my head, which is what exactly what happens when I'm going on a long run or a long ride. But the last few years, I've started to focus more on zone two training and, and trying to go for longer distances and improve my endurance. And it's fascinating. Like the, the bonking, it, um, having real-time CGM data, first of all, is phenomenal because you can see it happening before it hits you, before the, the symptomatic effects hit, hit you. And so I think it, it will be just simply a mechanism for improving fuel timing. Uh, is, is where this, this is going to go in the short term. And for me, you know, I've been trying to improve metabolic flexibility. So the ability to tap fat sources for, for energy and, um, it's going okay. A lot of this has to do with, uh, doing fasting, fasted training. So, uh, trying to deplete glycogen before even beginning a workout and then 
uh, essentially forcing the body to kick into um, adipose tissue for, for the, the energy on the ride or in the run. And, you know, for me, uh, this is a slow process. My, one of my, uh, teammates is, uh, he's a really fascinating example where he has very quickly adapted to metabolic flexibility. And so he recently did an 18 hour fast followed by a marathon run and kept his regular running pace and crushed it. No calories. He didn't even drink water. And, uh, his, his blood sugar was rock solid the entire time. I mean, he just maintained something like 82 milligrams per deciliter the entire time. And, uh, and so for me, like I'll get on the bike and I'll go and I'll feel great. I'll be fasted and about 50 minutes in my blood sugar will just fall off a cliff and I'll hit, you know, on the, on the CGM, I'll be at like 55 and just dragging. And, uh, it, it's at that point when obviously 10 minutes earlier, I would have eaten a cliff bar. But my goal is to continue to tap fat for, for energy and to continue to improve that mitochondrial efficiency. So um, now where the future of, of the tech goes, I think for peak performance is a question that remains to be seen. And I actually think it's going to be totally dependent on the athlete's specific domain. So for explosive sprint sports, um, I don't think you care much about fat oxidation. I think you're going to care much more about um, increasing glucose availability. And so, you know, improving the, uh, probably lowering the insulin environment and enabling the body to very quickly, uh, release glucose and, uh, and oxidize it. And then for the longer duration, you know, sort of Tour de France athletes, um, I would guess that it's going to be all about mo mobilizing fat. And so those will be very different. And it's honestly, it, it remains to be seen. I think the science is at the very beginning, you know, we have a lot of standard approaches, but I don't think many of them take into account a individual ath athletes and their, um, their sort of body composition and genetics and how they actually metabolize and then be real time data. Um, and then also on the recovery piece, I think there's two things for me, like recovery comes down to respecting sleep. And I've noticed like a bi-directional relationship between my metabolic control and my, my sleep quality. So if I eat poorly, especially if I eat a sugary meal towards the end of the day, my sleep is destroyed and I have tons of heart rate fluctuations all night long, um, in, in sync effectively with my blood sugar elevations. And I think that's a really interesting thing. So, um, you know, the, the quality of my nutrition affects the quality of my sleep. And then, and then the quality of my sleep will affect my next day is quality of nutrition or, or the way my body metabolizes it. So, which we touched on earlier. So I think better insight there is going to be huge and then reducing inflammation. So blood sugar, massive blood sugar elevations are inflammatory events. And there's a huge release of a reactive oxygen species. And then you've got inflammatory cytokines and it's especially, you know, it seems to be dose dependent. So the higher the blood sugar goes, the, the higher the inflammatory response. And so I think athletes are doing a lot of refeeding that is potentially causing inflammation. And, um, I'm not entirely sure that it's, it's super detrimental, but it will be interesting to look into that and see like, is there a better way to refeed after an extreme athletic event than, um, the current approach, which is just get as many calories as quickly as possible. So you're, you're mentioning metabolic flexibility and I've done, I did keto, a ketogenic diet for a week and I have inflammatory bowel disease. So it didn't work well for me. I'm not doing that again. But I have done uh, a few bouts of, I guess, intermittent fasting. Or I guess, yeah, intermittent fasting. Because what we, time-restricted feeding and intermittent fasting often get inter interchanged. But I've gone, you know, three days uh, without eating, just, just water. And a couple things I noticed. One is that exercise sucks more. But in terms of actually tracking my weights in the gym, I'm hitting the same weights, the same reps. Um, I think there was even one time where I, I hit a, maybe not quite a PR, but I was able to improve from, from the previous session. And um, I have noticed with that cardio, things like cycling are miserable when I'm, when I'm fasting. And I'm guessing that's because I, I have pretty poor metabolic flexibility. So you were mentioning depleting your glycogen stores. And I also listened to Peter Atia's podcast, The Drive. And I, I think he was mentioning that the way he depletes his stores is by going on a really, really intense bike ride. Um, I'm curious how you deplete it. And then after you deplete it, then do you do weight training? Is that how it works? I think you can do it two ways. One would be to deplete it through, um, yeah, intense physical output. 
and then you, or maybe a combination of these two things, but the other way is just too fast. And, and essentially after I think 18 to 24 hours, uh, most people will have reduce their glycogen reserve to, to at least a minimum. Um, and, and it'll quickly be depleted in the first few, you know, 10, 20 minutes of, of exercise if you're doing an endurance, um, trial. So yeah, I, I think Peter Tia's approach is the sort of a Tabata, like, um, eight, eight seconds on uh, sort of approach on the rower where he'll just do like many repetitions of an extreme all out, uh, effort on, not the rower on an, an air assault bike. And, um, and then, yeah, he'll do, he'll do multiple rounds of that. And I, Sorry, I don't a, typically a, do that on a, what kind of bike? So on an air assault bike, it's a, it's essentially like a, you have a, a giant fan attached to the, both the pedals and the, you work the handlebars back and forth. You'll see these in CrossFit gyms and it's like a full body, you know, it's a, it's a destruction machine. Um, very, very brutal. Um, and I think that's his, his weapon of choice for that rapid kitchen depletion. One thing that I think is interesting about that approach is that um, if my heart rate gets high enough, and I think it's about 90% of maximum heart rate, my body will start to produce glucose at a really high rate. And I'll see a blood sugar elevation, um, pretty significant. I mean, I've, I've gone over 200 milligrams per deciliter from a CrossFit workout without eating anything. So um, I think what's happening there is massive release of cortisol and adrenaline, both of which seem to induce gluconeogenesis in the liver. And so my blood sugar will just start to climb. So I, I think that might be a little bit counterproductive if you're trying to deplete glycogen uh, and get into fat burning mode. So I, I'm not entirely sure what the right approach there is. I tend to go with the the former approach, which is to fast um, for like 18 plus hours before starting the workout and just slowly ramp up. And um, you know, inevitably you'll have consumed the glycogen stores and I'll just be careful not to exceed that heart rate threshold. So I don't kick over into glucose production mode and hopefully I'm just burning fat. And, and I will so see, by the way, a significant elevation in ketones, uh, towards the end of that, uh, that workout. Okay. Uh, so you, so you're measuring your ketones as well intermittently through finger stick. Yeah. Finger stick. And I'm also using a device called a biosense which is, um, it measures acetoacetate. Well, it actually measures acetone, breath acetone, but I think it, uh, the corresponding ketone is acetoacetate rather than BHB, which you measure with the finger stick. So I, I, yeah, I use both and that's kind of just an additional data point to try and figure out, you know, did I kick into, if I kicked into ketosis, it's very likely that a, a good portion of my energy was coming from, from fat stores during that exercise. If I stayed in kind of a low ketogenic environment and high glucose or like high regular glucose, then I would assume that, um, I was probably using glycogen. So I got two follow-up questions. First, have you, have you experimented with the ketogenic diet? And, um, and then the second one would be, you mentioned, you mentioned that it was counterproductive to, to have your glucose go so high. And, and I'm guessing that's because you're trying to improve metabolic flexibility. But if I don't want listeners to to, well, rather, I'd, I'd like to ask you, my understanding is that if you have high blood sugar while you're exercising, that's not necessarily a bad thing, like it would be after you're eating. So if we could just uh, hit on those two. I'll take the second one first, because I definitely agree. I, it's just for me, two different modalities of training. So um, using, if you're going to be working out in a high intensity, high intensity environment, you want your body to produce the appropriate fuel and um, that physiologically, like having a blood sugar elevation from a CrossFit workout, for example, is totally different physiologically from eating a really sugary meal that induces the same blood sugar spike. Like your, your body's inhibiting insulin. You're using, uh, that glucose directly in your muscles immediately. It's coming from on body sources. So it's coming from, uh, probably protein, probably fat on your, uh, in your body right now, it's being converted in the liver into glucose. So that's a really, I think, very positive process. And there's a ton of research connecting high intensity, like interval training with better insulin sensitivity and better glucose control for, uh, in some cases, weeks after a single session. Uh, and so I think that's definitely a good thing. It's just a question of if you want to improve fat metabolism for endurance, I think it might be counterproductive to elevate glucose from a high intensity exercise session just prior to doing that sort of longer duration effort, because you, you may be producing a ton of glucose, kicking yourself into like gluconeogenesis mode when in reality you want to just deplete gl glycogen and move into a fat metabolizing 
mode, if that makes sense. So that, that's just my thought process towards it. I, I, again, I, I don't think I've seen anything directly on this specific glycogen depletion approach um, that would tell me one way or another, which is better. Uh, but then to the keto or the, the keto question. Um, so I have always had trouble with the ketogenic diet. It's just, it doesn't appeal to me that much. Um, I, I eat primarily a high protein diet, moderate fat, low carb which um, some people would probably think is like borderline keto. And I definitely have ketones in my blood, like nearly all the time, but I'm not necessarily above that 0.5 millimolar threshold of ketosis. So um, I would say that I'm like, I'm, I'm high protein, um, definitely have a good amount of fat and can easily get into ketosis with a long uh, session of, of exercise or, um, you know, certainly through fasting. And those are the two approaches that I take to kind of cycling in into ketosis. That makes sense. And so there's essentially both you and I are going with the whole the, the fasting route rather than the nutritional route, which I think is easier personally. Um, but yeah, everyone everyone's kind of different. Now, um, Levels has had an amazing. I mean, you guys have been around for a little over a year. Is that right? Yeah, June of 2019, we incorporated. And it's, it's grown and it's, it's exploded in popularity. Really cool stuff. I'm excited to see where this goes. And I'm curious to ask you, where do you see this going? Where are you, where are you guys taking levels next? So first off, you know, we're, we want to dominate metabolic fitness entirely. You know, we, we don't see uh, the enthusiasm for health and wellness happening in a mainstream way without somebody totally changing the paradigm. And so that's what levels wants to do is just make metabolic fitness an aspirational goal for everyone. The way that physical fitness and mental fitness are currently kind of out there on the map, we need to establish metabolism as actually the foundation beneath those two, you know, your, your brain and your muscles can't operate and grow and, and function effectively if you cannot provide them with energy effectively. And that energy is uh, produced through metabolic processes. So, uh, that's step one is make, uh, you know, make this an aspirational and appealing product that everyone wants to use. And by default, I think we will benefit as a, as both a company and as a society from a huge amount of unknown development. Like we we are going to, of course, be introducing new analytes, continue to improve the algorithms that our, our, our product is uh, operating on and, and are providing scores and metrics to people. But then also we're going to see new entrants into the space. We're going to see, like we mentioned earlier, I think some really awesome uh, shifts in the technology. And then I think we're going to see a regulatory change um, when it comes to data being used uh, in sort of this, this in-between space between wellness and medicine. You know, I think that the same data that keeps you interested and keeps you feeling properly on your, your, uh, century ride could be very valuable for a doctor to see, you know, in a longitudinal sense to understand how you're living every day and to, to better inform the relationship between a patient and a physician. So I think that's really exciting is that we can, you know, kind of combine the interests here and, and make the, the sort of wearable bio wearable technology, the future of health and, and medicine as well. So that's the direction we're going is we want to merge these. We want to make the industry sort of combine forces. We, we certainly don't want this to be stigmatized as purely one or the other. You know, this is not just for fitness buffs. It's not just for medical folks and biohackers. This is the future of both. And together uh, we can decentralize the problem, give each person the empowering data they need to live healthier. And then also I think really transform our understanding of uh, the way the human beings metabolize. Super cool. I'm excited. I'm super excited. Um, now for the viewers that are watching or the listeners underneath this video, you can, you'll find a link where you can actually sign up for levels and skip the wait line, um, or rather skip the waiting list and, and jump ahead and, and get your, get started sooner. Um, but Josh, if someone wants to learn more about, about you or connect with you, where can they find you online? So I'm, uh, at Joshua's forest on Twitter and josh.f.clementi on Instagram. Unfortunately, the just the Josh Clemente was taken in both cases, but uh, you can find me on those. I, I'm also, um, you know, always kind of interested to to hear from folks directly through the, the the at levels accounts on both Instagram and Twitter. I'm I'm very you know kind of involved in in those, so definitely reach out to us in in, in both of those directions. And then 
Um, yeah, I, I would also recommend that people check out the blog that we have at levelself.com. It's, it's the current, we're, we're rapidly gaining on all other metabolic publishing in the sense that we are making metabolic research and the concepts of metabolism, metabolic fitness, metabolic flexibility, approachable and understandable, and just explaining how this affects quality of life in so many different ways and, and, uh, long-term risk. And so definitely check those out and give us feedback as well. Yeah. I, just, I want to second the blog. The blog is really, really well written and, um, yeah, just the way you guys break things down and and make it easy for the layman to read, I think, is, is excellently excellently done. Uh, with that, she's she's the uh, the content queen. Oh, I didn't realize that was Casey's work. Yeah, she's doing a great job. Then, um, well, Josh, it was it was really such a treat having you. Thanks for joining us here, and and um, yeah, we'll we'll see you soon. Thanks, Kevin, for having me on. This is a really really interesting conversation. I'm looking forward to uh, to updating in the future when we get more kind of more results from research and, and obviously uh, additional insights from the Levels program. Yeah, we'd love to. All right, take care.